I never thought about that. What was in that fucking fruit? And why? Why would God put something inside a fruit that would make him angry? <laughs> True love is the apple of Eden. It is in the biblical story of the fall from grace and expulsion from the garden that Adam and Eve define forever the traits that make us human. Curiosity, weakness, and the desire for each other that transcends even our loyalty to God. What was it about that fruit that was irresistible? What made it worth trading a state of perfect, naked, and immoral immortal bliss for a life of shame and toil in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread in some ways the normal course of human development represents a prolonged version of the story of the fall childhood is a series of disillusionments in which we progress from an innocent belief to a harsher reality I like to hang around with kids. Innocent belief. I mean, they just... Mason will make you happy, man. She is just so... clear. And fun. <clears throat> one by one, we leave behind our conceptions of Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, the perfection of our parents, and our own immortality. As we relinquish the comfort and certainty of these child, childish ideas, they are replaced with a sense that thanks to Adam and Eve, life is a struggle full of pain and loss ending badly. He's not particularly cheerful, is he? What's that saying? It's like, when I was a child, I'll, I played with my childish toys. When I became a man, I put my toys away. Something like that. <clears throat> when you think about it, it's remarkable that instead of being hopelessly discouraged by such a state of affairs, we persist in trying to extract happiness from our brief time on earth. Hold on. When you think about it, I, I had a thought about Mason. Uh, I zoned out there for a second. When you think about it, it's remarkable that instead of being hopelessly discouraged by such a state of affairs, we persist in trying to extract happiness from our brief time on earth. And of all the ways to pursue it, it is, as Genesis suggests, by cleaving to each other that we come the closest. What an amazing word is cleave, conveying at once opposite meanings, to split asunder and to hold fast. Mark Twain in Eve's diary put these words in her mouth after the fall. When I look back, the garden is a dream to me. It is beautiful, surpassingly beautiful, enchantingly beautiful, and now it is lost, and I shall not see it any more. The garden is lost, but I have found him, and am content. No one can, as I have, daily contemplate the detritus left behind by lost love without becoming a little cynical about the ways people choose those to whom they think, to whom they link their lives. Was this person completely different? I ask, at the moment you decided that you wanted to spend your life with him. Came to believe that he should be the father of your children? Was there no hint of doubt about his loyalty, steadfastness, his love for you? The discussions that follow this question reveal over and over the shallowness and stupidity of our younger selves. Hey, Dr. V and Baby Milani here for a quick word for our sponsor, Resellers Program. Resellers is the quick, easy way for average people like you and me to make a free $750 a month without hosting parties or doing sales. It's not an MLM. There's no credit check to see if you can be approved for it. It's a free $750 a month. Check it out, www.ultimatemoneytree.com or just text DRV to my friend Jerry at the number listed below. Perhaps it is the paucity, which means lacking, not much, small amount. Perhaps it is the paucity of good examples. So scarcity of good examples with which we grow up. Few people I talk to admire what their parents demonstrated to each other in the way of affection and commitment. 
In fact, I frequently hear a kind of cynicism about the possibility of lasting love based on what people have observed in the generation before. Comment really quickly if your parents were loving, committed, fighting, divorced, stuck it out, and then got divorced, always nice to, nice to each other, still married. I'm curious. So my dad left our, we left our family. My mother didn't want to leave her parents. So the choice was to take all of us over to the United States. Uh, but my mom didn't want to leave, so my dad just took me. And Renee's divorced, fighting. Mary Beth, roommates. That's a good description right there, Mary Beth. So he never saw his wife again. That's my mother. And that's what I saw growing up. And in my teenage years, he started dating. And I probably started dating when I was a little kid, actually. Elementary school. He just, he never brought home a woman. <clears throat> Except for one girlfriend. Well, two. Later on in life when I was all growing up. So, do you feel, look at that. Fighting, fighting, divorce. Wow. So here's my next question. Put cynicism, if you have cynicism about love. Because he says, in fact, I frequently hear a kind of cynicism about the possibility of lasting love based on what people have observed in the generation before. I guess I would say... That's one reason why Kizzy's mom and I never got married. Because I was like, you know, you're either committed or not. Marriage doesn't mean anything to me. You know, and there's no need for it. And now I would say I have a very good optimism about my relationship with Erica. She may not feel the same, but we're doing really good. It seems ironic that when people fall in love, no justification for their attachment is necessary. It is accepted that the process by which we are drawn to another is mysterious and beyond explanation. People talk about physical attraction, shared interests, some mysterious chemistry that pulls them together and makes them decide to share their lives. The people are... I just thought Erica was hot. Erica was beautiful. I mean, you look at her a certain way. The people around them accept this and go ahead with the elaborate and expensive ceremony that will celebrate the beginning of their lives together. When on the other hand, people fall out of love, the demands for an explanation are insistent. What happened? Who's at fault? Why couldn't you work it out? We didn't love each other anymore is not, in most cases, a sufficient response. To a large extent, this is an educational problem. One would think that such an important area of human behavior would be the subject of some consideration in the schools. Simon and Garfunkel in their song, Kodachrome, summed up their secondary education as follows. When I think of all the crap I learned in high school, it's a wonder I can think it at all. In the midst of such marginally relevant courses as trigonometry, industrial arts, and the ever-popular health, one searches in vain for a course in human personality and behavior that contains useful information on how to avoid catastrophic mistakes in one's choice of friends and lovers. That would be good. We should have a class on human behavior and reading people and personalities and so like most of life, the important task of choosing whom to fall in love with becomes another example of trial and error learning. If only the trials weren't so costly. Ooh. Trial and error. I mean, put costly in the comment sections if you know what he's talking about. I'll read that later. Again, so like most of life, the important task of choosing whom to fall in love with becomes another example of trial and error learning. 
If only the trials weren't so costly. Did you have a relationship that cost you a lot? A trial and error cost you a lot? Divorce, pain, abuse? I think we all did. I didn't. I mean, I lost my first relationship, but that was due to my own stupidity. I wasn't a good partner. I was financially ruined, upside down, embarrassed, ego driven. <clears throat> it wasn't really her. Now she couldn't work it, work through it with me. I could envision a curriculum constructed around the general topic, the pursuit of happiness. Interesting. It was a, a movie. Instruction would begin with a discussion of the definition of love. Next would, come, next would come some guidance on the subject of personality disorders, which would cover the characteristics of those most likely to break one's heart. The narcissist, for example. There would follow a section called Attributes of a Successful Marriage Partner. That's important. Kindness and empathy and how to recognize the presence of these virtues would be discussed. Finally, we would invite as guest lecturers people going through bitter divorces, as well as those in successful long-term relationships. The latter would have to be chosen carefully. When I listen to comments from elderly people who've been married 50, 60, or more years, answering the inevitable question about the secret to a successful marriage, it seems to me that a high tolerance for boredom often heads the list. Such bromides as we never went to bed angry or moderation in all things convey a philosophy more geared to survival than to pleasure. I agree. I feel like oh, all the time, like sometimes like these, these you know, old long-term couples give you horrible advice convey a philosophy more geared toward to survival than to pleasure. Don't we just want to be happy? At the end of the day, don't we just want to be happy? Where one, where one wonders is the idea of endless renewable love. If Adam and Eve have anything to teach us with their spectacular fall from grace, it is that the union of two people offers us the primary compensation for all the burdens of being human, the need to toil, the thorns and thistles, and the lifelong knowledge of our mortality. What did that forbidden fruit contain that made its taste worth the anger of God? The garden is lost, but I have found him and am content. Dude, that's deep. I never thought about that. What was in that fucking fruit that would that make you believe that happiness from God, like like it was worth it for man to to find Him, <clears throat> and why? Why would God put something inside a fruit that would make Him angry? <laughs> what a chapter, man! All those things are so. Important. I totally agree with him too. Like, we get terrible advice about love. We are so frou frou when it comes to finding love and marriage and people getting married and trying to explain it. Oh, I can't explain it. We just have such chemistry together. Yet, on the flip side, if you get a divorce, you gotta ex explain yourself. Why are you getting divorced? It just takes me back to that, uh, you know, Gary V. Don't you just want to be happy at the end of the day? Dr. V, if I just wanted to be happy, I would be 500 pounds. I would just sit around and eat all day. And then I go, would that really make you happy? To which you have to say, no. No, Dr. V, that would not make me happy. Think about it, right? And I did this in my, uh, one of my talks, one of my Sleep Academy talks, which is, you know, things that you think are a treat are actually punishments. Write that down. Things that you think are a treat are often punishments. So snacking is a punishment. 
four, like, oh, it's 4 p.m. I need something to eat is a punishment. Oh, he looks kind of cute is a punishment. I'll just do this one time. I'll have sex without a condom. It just feels so good. I'll just, it's a problem. It's bad ramifications. Things that we often think are treats are punishment. Classic cars, <laughs> punishment. <laughs> Cigarettes, punishment. Yep. You know, uh, Margarita Fridays, Taco Tuesdays, punishments. I do want to make some more of that birria taco though. That was good. I might look that video up again. I'll tell you what is not. I'm going to go, if the, if the grass is not too wet, I'm going to go, because you know, I don't like wet feet. I'm going to go walk barefoot in the garden. I'm going to let some electrons flow through me. I'm going to listen to a little bit of Joel Osteen, maybe a little Wayne Dyer. Love y'all very much. Have an amazing day. <laughs>